You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Imagine for one moment. It's October 8th of last year. You're a Canadian. You have extended family in Gaza. All hell is breaking loose. You are desperate to keep them safe. Ideally, you'd hope to bring them to join you here, far from the war. You might hope the government would help with this. But you would probably accept that it wouldn't happen overnight. The situation is chaotic, and the logistics are complex. October passes. Then November. The situation for your relatives, if they're still alive, becomes more desperate. And then in December... Good news. Canada announces a program intended to help families like yours with anchor relatives in Canada who can sponsor extended family in Gaza to bring them here to safety. So as soon as the program opens, which takes until January, you start that process. And by today, March 20th, nothing. Not for you, not for your family, not for any family. Lots of applications, lots of paperwork. No actual people out of Gaza. None. What went wrong here? Is this the government's fault? Or is it simply the impossible logistics of getting people out of a territory that currently has an army barricading them in? Can we fix it for the Canadians and their families in Gaza who are getting more desperate with every day? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Yara Elmore is a freelance journalist who is based in Toronto and Beirut who wrote about the issue with getting relatives of Palestinian Canadians out of Gaza. Hello, Yara. Hi, Jordan. Thank you for having me. Uh, You're very welcome. Thank you uh, both for uh, examining this issue and also for taking the time to talk to us. And I guess my first question is just the scale of this problem. Do we have any idea how many Canadians have family in Gaza right now? Is there any way to estimate? Honestly, Jordan, I wish I could answer this question, but I could not find any estimates of how many uh, people in Canada are trying to get family from Gaza to here. But what we do know is out of the unknown number of people who have applied, 986 applications were approved to move forward in the process. And one application is per family unit. That is not to account for all the people who are not eligible and all of the people who are not approved to move on in the process. So as you can imagine, it's quite a big number. We're going to talk about that process and uh, how it works, or I guess more accurately doesn't work in a few moments. But first, I I want to rewind uh, to the beginning of this conflict when Israel went into Gaza initially last October. What kind of help existed at that point? for people here to try to bring their family, um, whom they were obviously worried about, over to Canada? Yeah, so for when the attack first started, I think Canada was making an effort to bring Canadian citizens and permanent residents out of Gaza. Uh, and that included only immediate family members, uh, like uh, spouses and children who are dependent, so below a certain age. But of course, a lot of people were worried that a lot of their family members and loved ones would be excluded by this very limited policy. But even when it was in place, a lot of immigration lawyers I've spoken to said that the criteria for people to actually be evacuated was always changing. The paperwork requested was always changing. So it was already difficult then. And now with uh, extended family members, it is even more difficult and slow. And a lot of this process is unclear. What has the government done since then to try to deal with extended family members or to come up with something to clear up this process? And when was that? So about two or three months into uh, the attack on Gaza, uh, Minister Miller held a press conference in which he announced a new program for this emergency situation, which which would extend the eligibility criteria to more family members, including siblings, nieces and nephews under a certain age, and more people. And initially, this uh, the scheme was to be capped at 1,000 person, uh, which to this day is unclear if this cap has been met, if it's going to be extended, but it was a big point of controversy. Uh, so this was announced on December 22nd, I believe, but the program was only opened for application on January 9. So already a lot of time had passed and a lot of 
uh, people who would have been eligible had been killed. Right. Uh, and the last time I, I was able to talk with community organizers, they had said that at least 40 people who would have been eligible were killed since the program was announced until now because to this day, no one has been able to come to Canada through the scheme. Wait, nobody? Absolutely no one that we know of. Only 12 people are fully approved to come, but these are people who were able to escape Gaza on their own. So uh, their evacuation was not facilitated by Canada. Uh, and to my knowledge, they haven't gotten here yet. So we created this policy in December, implemented it in uh, early January, and we're now uh, in mid to late March, and it has helped zero people. I'm just, um, why hasn't it worked? Well, the Immigration Department and Minister Miller have repeatedly said it hasn't worked because we can't get people out of Gaza into Egypt to finish their processing and actually fly to Canada. Uh, But the issue that a lot of advocates and uh, refugee rights activists and family members are saying, well, what are you doing actually to this evacuation? We are aware that it is difficult. We are aware that people who seek it on their own have to pay thousands of dollars to do that. But what are you doing if this is the problem? And there has not been any transparency on that. But honestly, even before the stage of evacuation, there are a lot of barriers uh, in this program, including the questionnaires, the documents uh, that are needed. And even, you know, people haven't even been approved to be evacuated yet, hundreds of them at least. So there are a lot of question marks on, you know, if this policy was meant to work in the first place. Maybe can you explain in a, uh, I was going to say a perfect world, but even just in a functional world, how this policy is supposed to work? Like, what are the steps? Let's say if I um, am a Canadian with extended family in Gaza right now and I want to get them out, what do I have to do for it to actually happen? So what the policy, how it was planned to actually work is that on January 9th, People in Canada, permanent residents and citizens, so that includes students and people with different statuses here, can fill a web form to sort of say which family members they want to apply for unification with. So that included a lot of information on, you know, the the age documents, paperwork that had to be filled, notarized with a letter, notarized by a lawyer, and then submitted. Then the IRCC or the Immigration Department sends unique codes for these applicants called anchor relatives in Canada to be able to submit the actual visa application. And already we saw a huge lag in this where a lot of people have never received codes to actually finalize their application and they don't even know why. And for those who did receive codes and submitted the rest of their visa application, then there's the difficult part of getting family members from Gaza to Egypt uh, in Cairo where they can do their biometrics, uh, the rest of the security screenings and visa application to then be fully approved to fly to Canada. And Canada hasn't evacuated anyone from Gaza to Egypt yet. Hmm. Uh, So this is the process in general. It's not an ideal process even because a lot of, you're saying, you know, an ideal word or a perfect word, a lot of Palestinian community members have been saying, well, there was a better scenario at the height of the war in Ukraine, which is, of course, ongoing, Canada responded really quickly and extended uh, visa applications to all Ukrainians, not only Ukrainians with relatives in Canada. The process was fast. It took a couple of weeks. A lot of people were actually able to come with a lot of support of the government. So Palestinians are asking, "We, we have a program that works. Why was this not applied for us? You wrote in your piece, you spoke to a young woman named Iman, and I'm just wondering, maybe you can tell us a bit about her and and her family that she's trying to help and, and what's going on, just so we can humanize it a bit, because we've used a lot of bureaucratic language and it can feel like uh, endless forms and failures. And, you know, these are real families here. Absolutely. Uh, so Iman is a 20-year-old uh, young woman who came to Canada as a student and decided to continue, you know, her work here. She uh, met her husband here. They have a family, a young two-year-old. She's now six months pregnant. Uh, But the rest of her family in Gaza, meaning her parents, her grandparents, aunts and uncles, and her sisters, one of whom uh, is also pregnant and in need of a C-section probably with everything going on in Gaza. But her family right now, they're living in tents. 
in the cold outside, you know, with no access to food, with no access to medication. Last time I spoke with her, she said it was heartbreaking. Every time she's able to reach them or talk to them, they tell her, you know, the children are sick, her parents are sick, and their situation is really difficult. And Iman herself has been so stressed that she can barely sleep, she can barely eat, you know, but even with that, she is doing everything she can from the process, from contacting the immigration department and following up and advocating for her family to try to bring them to safety. And this seems like, you know, an ideal test of this program. And it's failed her? Like, what has she tried to do and where did her family get uh, stopped along the way? So Iman filled her applications for her parents and for her sisters. So these are three separate applications that Uh, she filled to get her family to safety in Canada. And she filled this first step, the crisis or the web form, the crisis web form, but she has not received a single code yet. So she was not able to submit the actual visa application for anyone. And she said a few weeks after she had submitted the initial form, she got an email saying, oh, well, we have missing documents from you. And she was telling me, The email did not say which application, I submitted for three families, which application, which document is missing. She reviewed everything. I believe she spoke to lawyers and she actually didn't have anything missing. So she was really frustrated by this process. She tried calling the IRCC several times, she told me, and no one was able to help her. Uh, So she's at the point where she's waiting. She, there's nothing she can do right now other than, you know, wait for her code so that I can submit the application. What are community organizers in the Palestinian community over here uh, doing to try to help people like her, but also just to try to get people out of there by any means necessary? So I think from day one, a lot of uh, Palestinian community members here have been calling their MPs, emailing their MPs and asking others to do the same, to sort of uh, push for a policy that's smoother, faster and actually functional. And this is something they keep on doing. Another thing, they have been organizing a lot of silent vigils, uh, especially to commemorate those family members who were killed while waiting for this process to happen. Uh, There was one in Toronto near Eglinton a couple of weeks ago. It happened again at the end of February in Ottawa, where they were on Parliament Hill for three days, trying to get the attention of politicians passing by or even of the media to really highlight and amplify their voices. Uh, And I believe today and tomorrow they will be on Parliament Hill again with their banners, with pictures of their families, asking the government of Canada to actually fulfill its promise to bring them here. Has the government acknowledged, and I'm not trying to put words in their mouth, but how much of a failure this program has been, at least so far? No, absolutely. A couple of weeks ago, towards the end of February, I believe uh, Minister Miller, the Minister of Immigration, said, we are all failing Gazans. And we haven't seen much success so far in this program. Uh, but community members came at that like, thank you for acknowledging this, but what are you actually doing to make it work? So this is the biggest question that you are asking. Have they addressed that question? Are they saying, here is what we're doing to change this program, which clearly isn't helping extended family of Palestinians here or people on the ground in Gaza? Honestly, no. I wasn't able to get an interview with anyone at the immigration department. They sent me sort of a statement that said, you know, the same excuse we have heard over the last few months, which is it's extremely hard to get people from Gaza to Egypt. Uh, But even uh, community activists and immigration lawyers I've spoken to are really concerned by the lack of transparency with uh, what's happening with this program. What's the difference between getting people out of Gaza right now and getting people out of Ukraine um, when that war started? Is it just simply access because of Israel's blockade? I I believe so. I think obviously Canada doesn't have control over the borders at Rafah between Palestine or the Gaza Strip and uh, Egypt. Israel, Hamas uh, are some of the authorities that sort of grant these lists of people who are cleared to pass through uh, this border. But we've seen, uh, you know, the United States, we've seen Germany and other countries being able to negotiate the evacuation of their citizens and their families. Uh, So there's a question on why Canada is not able to do that. But officially, this is, I think, the biggest obstacle that that we face because as we saw in Ukraine, uh, people were able to get to other European countries 
and cross those borders and then from there maybe to come to Canada. But this has not been the case for a lot of Palestinians. While we examine sort of the bureaucracy at work here and how this program might need to change and people are waiting for codes, you know, I just want to end by asking you, how important is time right now? How much time do we have? How dangerous are things for those uh, right now in Gaza? I know, you know, everybody I'm sure listening has seen reports of hunger setting in. There are Canadians right now sitting in their comfortable Toronto houses, you know, as you described, like uh, talking to their families in, in unimaginable conditions. Absolutely. And when I interview people, they tell me, our family members haven't had anything to eat in days or weeks sometimes. So so imagine the starvation and how imminent that be. But even with, with the bombardments on Rafah, where almost a million Palestinians are crowded right now with nowhere else to go, death is at the doorstep every day. As Iman said, a precious life is lost. And already many, many lives were lost of, you know, relatives of Canadians who are waiting to bring their families here. So I cannot emphasize enough how urgent this issue is. Yara, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. And uh, obviously, uh, hopefully we see progress pretty quickly because the clock is ticking. I hope so. Thank you, Jordan. Yara Elmore, writing in The Guardian. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can write to us with feedback on this episode or any other at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca and you can call us to talk to us or at least our voicemail at 416-935-5935. The Big Story is in absolutely every podcast player and it's in all the smart speakers too if you ask them to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. Tomorrow.